for now. All right. Entonces, bro, something I want to cover with you is when people, when you start to do a quote for somebody, uh, like, what do you, how much coverage do they need? It's always a question, no? Bueno, let me kind of give you a rule of thumb when it comes to giving somebody coverage. When you give somebody coverage, one thing that I always do, I kind of take their yearly income. So let's say that, you know, we have somebody that um, their income is um, 38,000 a year. Do you know what do I do to find out how much coverage they need? They, they need? All I do, bro, is add a zero to it. So, okay, so you add one zero, you move the comma, and that's roughly what they need. So if I want to round it up, it's going to be anywhere between 350, 350,000 to 400,000. You see that? Got it, yeah. Now, if they can afford it, is say, I'm going to give them exactly what they want. But many times you need to know that one thing is what clients need, but a second thing is what they can afford. See, what if, what if the 400,000, it's going to cost them $250 a month as an example. And right. their budget was 200 bucks. They told right. you, Hey, Jesus, you know, we can totally save, you know, 200 bucks a month. You were like, Oh boy, we're going to have to sacrifice what you need in coverage. So then yeah. you might end up giving them maybe $200,000 because out of the $200, $100 are going to go there. And then yeah. maybe the other $100 are going to go into the investment. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so when it comes to like finding out coverage, yeah. Now, another point when it comes to coverage. My point of view when it comes to coverage, the longest the term, the better. Because what's going to happen is that if we are able to guarantee a long term on a policy, it's better because then we can play. Um, um, we can even like adjust the coverage, you know, but we already have the guarantee for that period of, for, for that period of time. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so you were asking me, for example, what about the 18 year old girl? You know, what do you recommend for her? Yeah. Whenever we're going to make a recommendation on how much coverage somebody needs, well, we need to ask, first of all, if there's any kids. Hey, there's 18-year-olds that already have kids. So kids, maybe there's no kids. Uh, do they have any dependents? You know, maybe not, you know? So maybe it's just, it's, it's just themselves. So what I, would, that what I would ask next is, what is, how much money do you make? So if that 18 year old says, well, you know, I'm making about $20,000 a year. I'm making about 1500 bucks a month. Well, you add one zero. Well, guess what? She'll probably be enough with maybe, I don't know, $150,000 and that's about it. Yeah. So what I would do for the 18 year old, I'll give her the longest term possible. Why? Because when people are young, they're not, they're not going to be able to ever get that pricing again, ever. When yeah. people are young, it's the best time to get the coverage. Because remember one thing, in order for somebody to qualify, in order for somebody, when somebody gets life insurance, life insurance gets calculated with a few things. How does the price get calculated? Well, one is coverage. Another one is age. Another one is health. So it's the coverage, the age, and the health. Now, age and health, never get better. They always get worse. Now, what do I mean? I mean, it's not, uh, well, let, let me explain. With age, we're never going to get younger. And when I mean health, I mean, we are, we're going, um, you know, we're always approaching yes. death. Does that make any sense? So age and health never really gets any better. So um, the, the younger the person is, the better off you know they're going to be. The healthier the person is, the better off they're going to be. So if somebody is 18 years old, then guess what? That is the absolute best time to do it. So what, do right. I, so what would I do for an 18-year-old? Of course, give her the longest term possible, which is what? A 35-year 30, term. Got it. So what, questions do you, what are the questions were you facing when you were filling out the application? Uh, let's see. What was it? 
Oh, let me mention another one. There's different types of coverage, custom advantage and term now. Custom advantage and term now. Term now, no exam is needed. Custom advantage, exam for sure. Okay, now term now, the minimum you can do for term now, uh, no, 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 wait. The maximum, you, see, there's a $300,000 max coverage you can do for term now. Okay, the minimum you can do in term now, I, I forgot what it is, but I think it's like 15,000 of coverage. Custom advantage, the minimum coverage, it's 150,000, minimum. Maximum, unlimited. Term now, they cap you at 300,000. Because remember, one is no exam, the other one is exam 100% of the time. So now, Custom Advantage has different classes. Now, what do I mean by different classes? On Custom Advantage, you have tobacco user. You have non-tobacco user. You have preferred, and you have preferred plus. And of course, it goes from, from more expensive to less expensive. Now, term now doesn't have as many classes. Term now only has tobacco and non-tobacco. That's it. There's no prefer, prefer plus. Okay. Right now, we have been doing a lot of term now because a lot of clients are not wanting to do an exam. They don't want anybody to visit at their house. Plus, when you do a term now policy, you can get an instant answer within 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Yesterday, I did a policy for a 20, 28 year old guy. 15 minutes later, policy was approved. Boom, immediately. They get an email. I get an email too. So, Right now, we're trying to avoid, you know, the, uh, the social interaction with people. So that's why we're doing a uh, term now, a lot of term now. Now, if clients need a lot more than 300,000, let's say, you know what, I want half a million. Hey, the max you can do with term now, it's 300,000. And then if somebody wants half a million, then you're gonna have to go through the custom advantage route. Does that make any sense? So, uh, what else were you facing, you know, when you were actually doing the policy? The waiver question. Okay. Good question. Waiver of premium. What is waiver of premium? Waiver of premium, you're going to see two options, either yes or no. So the People say, okay, so what do I select? Waiver of premium means this, bro. When somebody becomes disabled, okay, for more than six months, we pay for the policy until the age of 95, bro. Okay? So we pay for the policy uh, indefinitely. Now, so, but the, remember, the benefit works this way. What if you've been in disability for three months? Does the benefit kick in? No. You need to be in disability for at least six months before the benefit kicks in. Now, what if on the sixth month you're still in disability? What happens in those six months? You still have to be paying for the policy, okay? You've got to be paying for the policy. Even though that you may not be working, you've got to find a way to pay for the policy. On the sixth month, if you're still in disability, the benefit kicks in and the company refunds you the six months you were in disability. Okay, you just gotta make sure that you keep it active. So now what if you stay in disability for 10 years? The policy pays itself for 10 years. You come out of disability, then you start paying for the policy again. If you're like back from disability that you know you're fine, you know, up and running, you need to start paying. 
If you were to stay in disability permanently, then it goes all the way until the policy actually ends. We actually pay for your policy forever. What are the questions? Oh, can I have a question? Elizabeth, can I ask, yes. Okay, so, um, so you're going through um, disability, the company's paying for your premium, and your policy, the term is, uh, you know, it ends at, what, 75, and you're still on disability, but you want to continue with the policy. Are you able to do that? Oh, yeah, remember, our policy doesn't end on year 35. The price ends in year 35. The policy doesn't. Remember, the term we give clients, it's just the guaranteed amount of time we give them for that particular price. But the, our policies go all the way to 95 years of age. So yeah. the so they would able they will would be able to continue with the policy to ninety five where Prime America would still continue with the premium. Yes. But Prime, at ninety five they be cut off. Okay. Yes. Okay. Prime America will still continue to pay for the policy. Okay. Okay. Now one more thing about waiver of premium. How many of you guys know what um, um, terminal illness benefit rider is? Do you guys know what that is? Terminal illness. Sounds benefit familiar. rider. Huh? I said it sounds familiar, but I don't, I don't remember. Okay. The terminal illness benefit, this, this comes with every policy. It means that if you have a $100,000 policy and you're diagnosed with a terminal illness, such as cancer, as an example, the doctor gives you this, a six-month um, notice, meaning that uh, you know, you have six months to live or less. This benefit kicks in. What does it mean? If you have a $100,000 policy, we can give you up to 40% of that in cash while you're alive. So you can actually fight your, your disease. So we give you what? $40,000. You, uh, you can take out up to 40% uh, 40 of your benefit. Okay, now, what if you say, what if your policy, you selected waiver of premium? Yes. If you actually had a waiver of premium on your policy, the benefit, for, it goes from 40% to 70% on the uh, terminal illness benefit. So that means that if a client was paying for, uh, for waiver of premium, your benefit instead of 40,000, it goes to what? Seventy thousand. You see that? So when you are asking them if they want a waiver of premium, so um, if they choose, so they have if they choose yes, they have to choose yes on both, right? Isn't that? Well, this is what happens, Elizabeth. Whenever I'm doing the quote, depending what budget I have. I select waiver of premium on everybody and I just explain it as part of the benefit. Okay. Now, if let's say, you know, I was talking to Jesus, you know, early. See, many times, let's say you have a client that makes $38,000 of income. Okay. How do, you, how do you know how much coverage they need? All you do is you just simply add a zero to their yearly income. That's how you can kind of calculate you know, somebody's coverage, okay? You add a zero. But what if clients told you that their budget is $200 and giving them $400,000 of coverage is gonna cost them $250 a month, as an example. Well, guess what? Now you're gonna have to sacrifice what they need because there's one, there's one, the, when, when, whenever we do a plan for families, we need to know that there's a big difference between giving them what they need versus what they can afford. See, what if you tell me, Elizabeth, or, or Jesus, I need a million dollars by the time I'm 65. All right, well, that's gonna cost you $1,000 a month. Oh, I don't have 1,000 a month. So then you're gonna have to sacrifice either the amount or the age. You're gonna have to invest longer 
or you're going to have to settle for less money because all you got is 500 bucks a month. So one thing is what clients need. Another thing is what clients can afford. So if the client needs 400,000 of coverage and it's going to cost them 250, but their budget is only 200, what am I doing? I'm going to have to sacrifice coverage because he doesn't have the budget. So what I'll do is that maybe I'll, re I'll drop the coverage to 200,000. So now let's say that it's going to cost me a hundred dollars for 200,000. All right. Now the other 100, it's probably going to go towards the investments. So you guys need to know that. So you got to play like those numbers in your head. You know, you got to make sure that now if somebody is young, then you can suck, you can send more money towards the insurance and less money towards the investment. Why? Because they have the luxury of time still. Okay. Older people, you may want to sacrifice some coverage so that we can put more money in the investments. Does that make any sense? Now, Jesus, I'm going to recommend, bro, that you download one application on your phone or your iPad. I use this application every now and then. Um, where is it? Um, my God, I need to get rid of some applications here. Oh, there it is. Do you see where it says easy calculator? Second row, almost the last one. There's a calculator with some coins. Look, it's that one. You see that? So it's this one right here. Boom. Easy calculator. When you click on easy calculator, this is going to populate. Do you see the first, second, third, fourth that says compound interest calculator? The fourth one. You click there, this is just a general calculator. And this is where you can help clients calculate um, how much money they're gonna end up with, you know, if, if they put their money in an investment account. So principal amount, let's say it's a hundred bucks. Monthly deposit, a hundred bucks, period, which is months. So let's some, say, let's say somebody's going to invest for 30 years, 360 months, okay? Annual interest rate. So let's say that the client is going to get an average of 10%. Here on this one, we can utilize any return we want. I never really show any, anything above you know, 10%. I only show 10%. The Primerica calculator only allows you to show 9%. So, you know, just for the sake of this. So if I click calculate, client will end up with roughly what? 229,000. But you see where it says total principal? How much money came out of client's pocket for the investment only? 36,000, but they end up with 229,000. Okay. So this is something that you could, you know, use, you know, sometimes, you know, if you want to calculate uh, an investment, but you can also do the Primerica one, you know, but the Primerica will only allow you to calculate up to 9%. And believe it or not, you know, 9 to 10%, it doesn't make a lot of difference. 229, 229 versus 185 just 1%. See that? It does make a difference. So it makes a little difference. And 10% is still something that is uh, conservative. You know, we're, we're not, you know, we're not exaggerating. We're not hyping numbers. It's still below what our average growth mutual fund has been able to do, you know, for the last, you know, 50, 60 years, which has been above 10%. But we just kind of like, you know, leave it right at 10%. So whenever somebody asks you like, oh, look, look, sometimes I have close clients sharing this calculator with them because once they see it and they, don't, they just don't simply take my word for it, they go like, oh, okay. And it says right there, compounding. This is compound interest. You show this to a client, they look at the 229,000 on their own on this calculator, it makes it more real. And then you could say, look, what if you were to change your monthly deposit from 100 to 150? It goes from 229 to 343. 
Now, what if you were to start your account with 5,000? You start the account with 5,000 and you put $150 every month. Now you end up with 441,000. You see, it has so many variations. This allows a, you to like, yes. I have a question. Um, I, I've heard it mentioned that in an IRA, the max um, contribution is 5,000 a year. Is that, is that true or? Yeah, let me tell you, it is true. But what happens when I do IRAs with 25,000? It's because it's a rollover, Elizabeth. See, if they have, a, if they have an IRA with $15,000 somewhere else, I'm rolling that over. See, and when I roll that over, it doesn't count for the year because that money was invested for other years. So I might be able to do a rollover, you know, taking $15,000 from that old IRA, and, and then we keep on contributing to this one, and boom, they end up with more. Now, let me give you the, 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 the top contributions so that you guys actually know for a fact. So IRA, you know, contributions for 2019 or for 2020. Because at the beginning of, of every year, they, they give us new, uh, uh, they, give you, uh, they give us a new, uh, new limit, the IRS. So there it is. Roth and traditional. The 2020 limit contributions for Roth and traditional is $6,000 now or 7,000 if you are age 50 or older. So right now, the maximum is 500 a month if you are below 50 or an additional $1,000 a year if you're over 50. Now, this is per person. Okay. And let me see. Now check this out. If somebody makes $196,000 of modified adjusted gross income combined, if they make more than that, they can't qualify for the Roth. They got to go the regular way. Okay. So most of our clients are going to qualify because most of our clients don't make $196,000 combined. But every now and then you do have, you know, a few clients that, you know, make that. And the contribution limit is going to be the same. Um, oh, no, wait, if, if you make anywhere between 196 to 205, your contribution limit is going to be reduced. I got to find out exactly because I, 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 I didn't see that in the past. If you may, oh, there it is. If you make more than 206,000 or more, you're not eligible anymore. You see that? If you're single, you got to make less than 124,000. You got to make less than 10,000 a month. Uh, to qualify for the Roth. Okay. And then traditionals, of course, there's no limits. You can make whatever amounts. I don't know if this is a good question or not, but why is it, why is that the, like, why is that that number? Why, why is it because you make a certain amount of money that you can't, contribute or can't even qualify for the IRA, the IRS, sorry. Why is it that your income like limits you or like why, why is it that disqualifies you? Um, I don't know. I guess because they want you to, um, well, it could be a couple of things. When you have a high income, you're paying a lot in taxes. So maybe what they do, maybe what they were thinking is that um, you, don't, you, you don't contribute on this one because this is not gonna be tax deductible. If you put the same contribution on a traditional, then that will be deductible. For example, if people put money in a Roth IRA, they cannot deduct it from their taxes at the end of the year. But if you put money on a traditional where there's no limit how much money you make, that $7,000 is gonna be deductible that year. So it's gonna reduce your tax liability at the end of the year. Now, the only caveat about that is that I would still rather See, I don't qualify for, um, for a Roth IRA anymore, okay? So 
Uh, but when I did, you know, I loved it because it's tax free. It's going to be tax free. Whatever amount of money I end up with in the future is going to be tax free. And, you know, and I guess, you know, those are the rules that, you know, Mr. Rock, you know, came up with. No, yeah, it's actually his last name. The guy that came up with the, this idea, his last name is Roth. That's why they call it Roth IRA. Yeah, the guy invented it. You know, if you, if you kind of read the history of the Roth IRA, it's his last name, Roth. Mr. Roth, I forgot what his first name is. So for like the people, like the, the two people that are asking me for investments, um, how, do I, how do we go about that? Okay, very good question. When people ask you about investments, guys, let me tell you one thing. Investments, it is something that we just cannot um, pinpoint just one fund and that's it, or one account. There's so many different variations on investments. For example, if you tell me, Alonso, I have $100,000 to invest, where should I put it? Well, I, I'm, I can tell you, you know, look, um, I have a text message from a guy that sent me a screenshot of his client bank account where the guy has like $200,000 and like another 200,000 on a different account. What do you suggest this guy do? I'm like, I'm not going to suggest anything. I said, I, th let me tell you why. If you tell me alone, so I got a hundred thousand dollars to invest. Where should I put it? Can't tell why I don't know the purpose of the money. If you tell me I'm going to buy a house next month. Oh, okay. Now I know what the purpose of the money is. Does that make any sense? Yeah. You tell me, oh, this is college fund for my kid. Oh, really? How old is he? 10. Okay. We got eight years. You understand? So yeah. I got to know horizon. I got to know uh, the purpose of the money. If you tell me, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to buy a house in the next couple of months. Where do you think I'm going to suggest you put it? I'm going to suggest you leave it in your bank account. Do nothing with it. There's no, there's no point in me taking your money and charge you a fee to invest that money when you're going to pull it out in a couple of months. And maybe we're not even going to be able to make back, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the sales charge that I charge you to invest the money. See, because most of our clients, guys, they, uh, most of the accounts we do are long-term accounts or midterm accounts. You know, short-term accounts, I'm going to do a money market account if somebody just wants to have emergency money in there. Now, for emergency money, we're not charging anything. We literally charge nothing and we make nothing. We don't make a penny. But we just simply open the account so they can have it for emergency purposes. And it's not like a savings account where they can easily take it out. So when somebody has, tells me I got seven grand, all right, great. Well, and I also got to know, do you have more money saved? Is this all you got? Uh, sometimes, you know, clients tell me I got a hundred thousand dollars. I want to put it, I want to invest it. I said, okay, do you already have an emergency fund? Do you have money in your checking account? No, this is all I got. Then I'm not taking a hundred thousand. I'm probably taking about maybe 80,000. You need to keep 20,000 for expenses or emergencies. Why? Because I don't want you to, I, I don't want you that the first flat tire you get, now you're pulling money from the investment. And now I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to get questioned by Primerica, like, why did you take all that money when you knew that the client didn't have money in his checking account? So, you know, th this is, you know, so when it comes to investments, you got to have a very legit, you know, advisor too. You got to have somebody that's really like looking after the client and it's not looking to maximize. Yeah. Much I, I did have somebody tell me, Hey, I heard you guys help people with like uh, college funds. Like how do I invest for my kids? College yeah. funds? Then there you go. So now that yeah, now we know the purpose, college funds. So when somebody says, I got seven grand for what? College fund. Oh, okay, great. What kind, you know, how many kids? You know, how old are they? Oh, 17. She's going to college next year. I'm like, eh, you don't have too much time. I say, you know what? Just uh, I don't know, you know, just maybe just keep it. I, I wouldn't even want to work with that money, to be honest with you, because I don't want to make any promises and then the market you know, you know, takes a dip a year from now and then he even has less money than what he had initially. So it's a little too late. So, you know, yeah, I wouldn't do it. I, I wouldn't do it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not here to maximize as much buck as possible. You know, I'm, I'm here to do, you know, the right thing for the client and for me too and for the company.
So what are the questions, you know, what were you facing or you guys are facing out there? So somebody's asking us questions in regards to investments because we're not licensed for that yet. Should we not be answering those questions? Or what do you, well, this what is do you what's your advice? You know, most agents have some basic knowledge or some general idea. Somebody tells you, so what's the maximum contribution on an IRA? Well, I don't know, maybe by your own example, if you have your own, your own IRA, I say, well, you know, my IRA allows me to invest, you know, uh, $6,000 a year because I'm below the age of 50. And if you're uh, above 50, you say, well, it allows me to invest 7,000. Those are the limitations. Um, like what's the best fund? Now, when they're asking about funds, this and that, you go like, look, what we recommend to do is this. We're going to get you qualified for this financial plan. Our follow-up call, we're going to make it with their, with their investment advisor, with their, with their specialist on, on regards to our investments. We're going to get on the call and then he's going to explain to you exactly what fund we're going to be using for this. But I'm telling you, you're going to, you're going to be pleased with the education you're going to get because we're going to educate a client. Look, I've had appointments, guys, with people from Rancho Santa Fe wealthy people that, you know, that have their money at the bank. You know, they, they have a lot of money because they build businesses, but that doesn't mean they know stuff about investments. And they were challenging what I was saying. Hey, at the end of the day, I'm right. I know I'm right because I know what I'm doing. You know, I, you know, this is my craft. You know, their craft might be, I met with a guy that he owned a rent, a car rental company and, you know, he made millions, but you know, his, his craft is renting cars. My craft is doing this stuff. I know that this is good for you. Oh, the market, this and that. Look, regardless of what happens with the market, look, if I didn't trust this, I wouldn't have all of my, all of my mom's retirement money here. All of it is here. All of it. When, when my Nana retired three years ago, four years ago at 70, uh, 69, every dollar, every dollar on, on her retirement account went into Invesco, every dollar. It's been four years. She hasn't had the need to take any money out. So market goes up, market goes down. I'm like, you're fine. Don't even worry about it, Nana. You're fine. You're, you're, you're taken care of, you know? So that was what, speaking of market, like um, I remembered you guys have like a portfolio where it shows yeah. like the little graph. Is that, is well, that on the website or? No, this is something I have to share with you. So what I'll do I'm going to share something with you as if you were my prospect client, my future clients. Okay. I will share this uh, brochure with you that shows you a little bit about the company. For example, I'm going to show you one portfolio, Invesco Equity and Income Fund. I personally like, you know, this portfolio for many reasons. You know, I, I actually own this well too. Okay. So, this portfolio right here, it tells you at the top right here, after their summer wedding in 1960, Bob and Karen invested $10,000 in Invesco Equity and Income Fund. The greens remain invested through the market's ups and downs, always reinvesting their dividends. By December 31st, 2017, their original investment might have helped to provide them with a secure retirement as well as a legacy for their families. So that means that this is an illustration of a $10,000 investment that you see right there in 1960 from this couple. They left the money there and they left it there all the way into two, until December 31st, 2017. That money grew to $2.7 million. And the average return they received for the last 60 years or 59 was 10.29% average per year. When I say average, I mean some years were a lot higher, some years were a lot lower, some years were even negative, some years were like crazy up, like maybe 30, 40% in one single year. Does that make any sense? But the average was what? 10.29. This portfolio right here has roughly more than 300 different securities in the fund. What does that mean? 
it has more than 300 different stocks in this portfolio. So in order for you to lose this money, the reality is that 300 different stocks, they only are 300 different companies. They all need to file for bankruptcy at the same time. Now, people might be wondering what kind of quit, what kind of companies are those? I want to know. Great. I'll show you something they call the top holdings. Starting at the top, it has companies like Citibank, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, Citizens Financial Group, Oracle Systems, Philip Morris, Royal Dutch Shell, General Motors, Cisco Systems. Now, and I always ask, you know, I mean, have you ever used any of these? Have you ever had a Buick, Chevrolet, GMC, Cadillac? Have you ever, you know, gone on, on a uh, Carnival Cruise? Have you ever had a Natville, Chapstick, Gravito Scene? I won't go on the next one, okay? But, you know, have you ever, you know, used, you know, uh, have you ever used CVS or something? Pharmaceutical, right? You know, health services, you know, eBay, Intel. Have you ever had a Windows computer? Comcast, have you ever watched Telemundo? Have you ever watched NBC? Charles Schwab, do you have, you know, Verizon with your cell phone? See, these are just some Symantec Corporation. It, it, it handles all the securities of computers, Northern, LifeLock, ID Analytics. It's the uh, company that keeps our information safe. It's the antivirus, you know, companies, you know, for computers. These are just some of those 300 different companies. So think about it. All of these companies need to fire, need to fire for BK at the same time in order for you to lose your money. So Jesus, what is the likeliness of that? I ask that question. I, say, I always say, Mr. Klein, what is the likeliness of all of these companies filing for BK? Oh, like, it's almost impossible. And if somebody tells me, oh, it's very doable, I'm like, the likeliness of 300 of these companies all filing for BK, it's likely? You think it's likely? They go like, oh, yes. I'm like, I don't think so. I said, the worst year we've had in the last 90 was 2008. It wasn't even close to 20 big companies that filed for BK, not even 20. Okay. I could mention a few big ones, but no, 300. No, absolutely not. No, no, it's, 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 it's pretty much almost impossible. Okay. So, so I kind of share this portfolio and when you show a graphic like this one, boom, you know, people just like, so what I'll do is I'll share this portfolio with you. I'll send it over to you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, one more. Um, just to, so like if the client asks, you know what, I want less insurance, I want le less money to go to the insurance and more of my money go to the investment. Okay, all right. So let me tell you one thing. When somebody tells me that, I first look at their situation. When you go to the doctor, do you tell the doctor how much penicillin you need and how much, how many pills you need or? No, no, it doesn't work that way. So first of all, you got to know, you know, like what clients are saying, oh, you know, I want less money this. Okay. So you just simply kind of take it that way. Okay. And you go like, all right. And this is the example that I would do. Right. So when somebody tells me I want more money going here, want more money going there. First of all, I need to know their situation. So just for the sake, let's say that somebody gave you a $300 budget. And let's just say, hypothetically, that $200 was going to go for the insurance because that's what they need. And $100 is going to go for the investment. All right. As an example, I, what if I really believe they need that half a million on him, half a million on her, because they each make 100000 a year. They definitely need half a million dollars. Okay. But they said, and let's just say that these, this couple, it's in their 40s, 40 years of age, each one of them. So in reality, they still have what? Another 30 years to go, almost, before they make it to kind of like retirement, right? So we still have plenty of time to eventually increase the budget. But at this moment, I want to lock in the best price possible for insurance. And let's say that it is just going to take in 200 bucks. But they said, you know what? 
Now, I think I want to put more money. I want to put actually $200 on my investment and only maybe $100 on the insurance. But that is going to drop the coverage, let's just say, to $150. Probably not going to be that much, but I just want to give you the example. So we get to do this. Then I ask the client, I'm like, okay, what would happen if you were putting in 200 bucks on the investment because you wanted more money there and only a hundred dollars into the insurance, right? What if something happens to you two years from now? Two years from now, something happened to your husband you get $150, 150,000 from the insurance. And on your investment, you're probably going to have about, let's say $5,000. So you're going to have roughly about $155,000. They were making $100,000 each. They were making 200,000. Now all of a sudden, you know, $100,000 are going to be gone. The question is, how long will they survive with those $155,000? It ain't going to take into, it's, it, they're not going to go too far with that. Does that make any sense? Because they sacrifice, you know, the insurance, they sacrifice the, the coverage, you know, for the investment. When, when people are young and they have the luxury of time, they can still afford to have more money go for the insurance versus the investment. See, with the investment, the investment is for later. The insurance is for now. You ask the client, let me ask you this. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, would you rather have half a million or 150,000 of coverage? Well, no, half a million. Like, like I would send all of it for the insurance and I would probably get a million. See, well, we don't know what's going to happen. And I do certainly do, do hope that nothing happens to you tomorrow. Okay. But when planning for your finances, you got to look at the, um, you got to look at it from the outside. You still have 30 years of investing, but you only have today to lock in this price because a year from now, it ain't going to cost the same. It's going to cost more and every year is going to keep on costing more. So there's no better time for you to lock in the coverage and the price than right now because you'll never be able to get it again. Why? Because insurance gets calculated on two things, age and health. And neither one of the two go lower. They go higher, meaning like, you know, you're, you are at a higher risk or developing something than we're actually reducing it. So you kind of explain that. You look at their situation. If you think like, yeah, maybe the client's right. All right. You know, sometimes, you know, patients do convince doctors of maybe doing something else, right? But most of the times, it doesn't really go that way. Like, dude, no, I, I look, like, trust me, you need to take this, you need to take these pills. And uh, I'll just, I'll just do the massage. No, you need pills too. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so let's say that you give them that input, that advice, and they still say, no, I want to do what I want to do. Do you still help them or you don't help them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do? Okay. Yeah. Now, if somebody tells me, I'm going to keep the insurance with somebody else and I'll do the investment with you, I don't do it. I just, I just say, you know what? I think it's better if you call your agent and just tell them to help you with the investment too. Because this is the thing. You are trusting me with the creation of your wealth insurance is part of it. What ha happens when you die? Your family is going to end up with money. It's going to become a battle between me and the other agent. The other agent is going to say, oh, this and that, you should do this. So what is your family going to end up doing? I said, if you trust them with your insurance money, I think you'll probably be better off if you just trust them with your investment money as well too. Because the reality is I know the, I know the value I bring. I don't need your business. I don't need it. You know, I want it, which is different, and you're going to be better off by doing business with me. That's just the reality. So, um, so I, I've said that to clients, you know, you know what? I want to keep my insurance somewhere else. I'm like, you know what? Have your agent, you know, take over your investments too. If you think he's, you know, he knows what he's doing, well, then just, just do it with him. You know, why leave some over here and leave some over there? 
And the problem is this, the agents don't know. Oh, their agents don't, can't take the investment most of the times because they don't know what they're doing. I just had one client that I didn't realize canceled my policy and went with another guy. And she said, well, can you help me with my investments too? The guy looked at the investments and he goes like, no, I think you're fine there. You know, just leave it there. And then I got to talk to her. I'm like, what were you doing? I said, did you ask this? Did you ask that? Did you ask this? Did you ask that? She just happened to do it with this guy because they started to work together. And, um, and they were going to a lot of um, networking events together. And, you know, he kind of became like, you know, a friend, forward slash kind of boyfriend. And I'm like, look. I said, why didn't you tell him to take the investment? Oh, because he told me that just to leave it where I was because I had a good investment. I said, and I'm like, you know what? Her name is Noemi. I said, Noemi, did you ask this? No. Did you ask that? No. Do you know if you have this? No. I'm like, come on, Noemi. I said, you sh I, I said look, you should have called me first. I said, pull out that policy and check, what it, check if what I just told you is the same. Because people believe that insurance, you compare it with price. It ain't the price. You got to check like a lot of different things, like the riders, like clauses, you know, restrictions, exceptions. Like, is it accidental? Is it life? Is it going to cover you here and everywhere? Does it have a, terror, a terrorist clause? Like, like, you know, many different things. Does that make any sense? So it's not only one thing. It's like, you know, many different things. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. So, any other questions? How? Uh, what's the difference? Like when someone just chooses a white, a, the waiver or not? Is there a huge difference in the premium? Oh, well, very good question. I forgot. Custom advantage and term now. Term now, it is slightly higher premium than custom advantage because the company is taking a higher risk by not doing an exam. Okay, so for example, if with custom advantage you were going to pay $50, maybe here you're going to end up paying $55. Okay, uh, if you do term now. Now, custom advantage, now waiver of premium, it's going to vary on age. The older the client, the more costly it, it'll be. When you're doing the quote, it'll tell you right there exactly how much it's costing you waiver of premium. You can select it and unselect it and you can kind of see the difference. So you can kind of play with it. All right. So I think we answered quite a few questions. Um, I'm, let me go ahead and stop the recording. So I hope that you guys, you know, got some, uh, you know, something out of this. And for whoever watches this, you know, training, if you guys have more questions, just, you know, reach out to whoever's training you so that they can clarify more answers. Let me go ahead and stop it. Talk to you guys later.